Magic is Lights. Magic. Uh, thank you all for attending. This is the last session of the last day. And uh, I'm feeling a little, I'm feeling, I'm feeling good. You guys feeling good? Yes. Um, how many people here actually, how many people work at an agency? Show of hands. <laughs> yes. Oh, most, most. Okay. Um, uh, you, you guys in the in the rear, in the last row, you guys work together? Everyone in this row? Yeah. What, what agency do you work with? Yeah. Giant Goat. Giant Goat? Okay. Yeah. And, uh, gen gentleman, uh, gentleman in blue? S the same? No, 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 no. No? Uh, yourself? Oh, Greg. Greg? Accelerant. Accelerant? Yeah. I work for agencies of that. You know, but they don't? Kalaluna. Mm -hmm. You work, your, the name of your agency? Sorry? The name of the agency that you work with? Actors. And yourself, sir? Okay. Um, it's good. It's good to know you guys have heard of. You have some notion of agency, agency life, your own agency lives. Most of you. Uh, some of what I'm going to talk about today may feel familiar, sound familiar. Some of it may be a little bit different. Um, my name is uh, Andrew Malice. I'm the CEO of co and co-founder of Calamuna. Uh, Kalmuna is an agency that works with mission-driven organizations. We are uh, committed to making uh, the world and the internet a better place. It is with uh, the help of the community here that we are able to do that. We work a lot in Drupal. We also provide design consulting services, strategy, etc. Our home base is in Oakland, California, uh, on the other side of the country. I am a uh, native of Toronto, Canada. Uh, and we have a few of our members in our primarily distributed team at this point. We'll talk a bit more about the challenges of working in a distributed virtual environment, the nature of the changing scope of work, the nature of work towards the end of the talk. Um, but that is where we are based. We're a US-based company. We'll talk a little bit about the differences between US and Canadian law. I have learned so much uh, since moving to the US eight years ago now. These are some of our clients to give you an idea of the breadth and scope and scale uh, which we operate. Um, this year, we, uh, we worked with the city of San Francisco, uh, just across the bay from Oakland, uh, doing a little bit, of, little bit more work in the, in the government spaces. Uh, we work a lot in nonprofits. Uh, Fair Trade USA was a big project for us uh, this year in Drupal 8. And uh, quite a, quite a, a smashing array of uh, higher education clients. Uh, always um, uh, tricky, uh, political, uh, variable, uh, and uh, we thrive in in those types of environments uh, because our, our membership embraces uh, diversity and uh, a, a very uh, humanist approach to problem solving, which in these types of institutions is, is really key uh, to meet with success. Uh, these are some of the ways that you can contact me. I use my real name for things. Uh, not too many other people have uh, my name, so you can use the, the standard search tools. I am on uh, Drupal.org and have been for some time, 11 plus years now. And uh, you can tweet at or with me email me. Uh, I am accessible. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I don't usually do this, but I thought it would be relevant because I started an agency um, and it's not something that many people do, but I think before I was in one and I thought about doing it, I'm like, well, who am I? Am I the type of person who could do this kind of thing or not? Are you the type of people who could do this kind of thing or not? What is involved? How does it change your life? And uh, how uh, have we been successful a little bit? Um, maybe, you know, might shed some light on things. 
So I, uh, I studied art at the Ontario College of Art and Design. Um, that's actually what ended up bringing us to California eventually. Uh, my wife uh, went to pursue her, her MFA uh, there, and so we moved, we moved out there uh, to, to Menlo Park while she was going to Stanford, and I got involved with the Drupal community there. I, I met some other people. We'll, we'll get to that. Back to the art, though. Uh, big picture stuff, always been interested in, you know, topologies and, and thinking about like the macro and the micro, uh, really, really looking at how to, um, how to, how to, how to narrow in, how to narrow in on something. Use some photographs, some aerial photographs that I've taken uh, some time back in, uh, in Nevada here. Um, but you know, I was looking for, I was looking for something new. I was looking to start something new. Um, and I've always been interested in art and computers and how those two things come together, how I could use technology in my art practice, which had a bit more of a traditionalist background, and uh, how I could blend that potentially with a history of uh, social activism. I was very interested in how we perceive technology, how we interact with that, mixing media. Some of that thinking has kind of informed the way that I've sought to brought, build a business. And uh, before, just before starting, uh, starting Kalamuna, I, I was a, a contractor, a freelancer. I had a bit of a Robin Hood mentality. Uh, I would take clients I didn't really want to work with. I would charge them more. And then I would give big, deep discounts to the work I really wanted to do. And then the world was on fire. Occupy started. I moved to New York City. I uh, lived there for a few months. I uh, helped to run uh, much of the digital infrastructure that uh, powered the movement, including making this website, the Occupy Directory, which was a, uh, a global directory and a very big data uh, project uh, that sought to shed light on where the conversation spaces were happening. It was built in Drupal. Um, it was a collaborative effort. It was all open source, free, everything free. And uh, you know, we garnered some attention, the work that we were doing in the, in the media and other spaces, and there was a real impact. And uh, when Occupy eventually fizzled out, um, I didn't have the patience for the types of clients that uh, I didn't want to work with anymore. And I thought, maybe there's a better way, maybe I don't need to bend over backwards, maybe um, I can stick to my beliefs and um, not compromise as much. So uh, my outlook changed and suddenly I started making more money when I was not interested in making money. It, it was, it's, it's like when you lose something, you know, you've lost your keys and you find them as soon as you stop looking for them. <laughs> it's like magic. Um, and so in the Bay, you know, I was looking for some other opportunities. I was looking maybe for some other people to collaborate with along these lines. Uh, there was a, a, few, a, few, a few dudes, a lot of dudes in tech, uh, we're trying to uh, fix some of that uh, in our agency. Um, a small shop called East Bay Development, which eventually would become uh, Kalamuna. We got together at this place called the Revolution Cafe, where there was a bit of a burgeoning uh, you know, culture of hackernish or hackishnish around, around Drupal. And uh, eventually, you know, we got an office uh, with some, some rafters and a nice old building that was a converted bank. I like to refer to it as the Bank of the Proletariat. Uh, on the front, there was a beautiful facade, some art deco motif. And, um, you know, we started to, to pick, some, pick some things up, pick some projects up, and eventually uh, grow. Uh, this was DrupalCon in Portland. We built a little uh, slideshow. Um, everyone loves slideshows on their websites <laughs> and in their promotional materials. Uh, but uh, we got uh, an actual slide projector, uh, printed some slides digitally, and uh, I have a, an amazing adventurous tale that involves um, the, the Hells Angels to tell you if you're interested after this as to how I found the uh, lenses that we we're going to project uh, our, our slideshow. Uh, Oakland is a fabulous place. So, um, 
you know, we continued to grow some more. This was our website back in the day. We're very, uh, you know, forthcoming with our, our value proposition. Eventually that uh, shifted a little bit more. Um, we matured a bit more as a brand and uh, we, well, maybe not that mature, this website was launched from this hot tub in San Diego, um, thanks to Pantheon, in one button, uh, with one button we were able to push from, from test to live um, without needing to leave the tub. So uh, our, our website doesn't quite uh, look like uh, this anymore on the front page, but um, our company has grown, matured a little bit more. And uh, it's, been, it's been an interesting journey. What, what I want to talk um, with you uh, about today is, is a bit of the lessons that I've learned in terms of how to run a business and uh, what that means behind the scenes. Uh, before doing this, I didn't appreciate what was all involved. I did some because you know I was a consultant. I ran my own business. But once you scale up and continue to scale, uh, things do change and, and your preoccupation changes. Uh, our organization is maturing. I'm uh, attempting to mature with it, and my role previously was to, you know, serve clients. Uh, things have changed a little bit. Um, my client uh, is now the team, and and so I, I work uh, for them. Uh, I want to show you a little bit behind the scenes of what uh, goes on in an agency, how we're built, how we're constituted. And oh, it's wrong behind the scenes. Uh, another <laughs> photograph that I took um, in Chicago some years ago. Um, but one thing that we really do in terms of deciding the direction of the company is engage everyone in that process. Um, we value uh, a high degree of transparency, uh, radical transparency, sometimes too much truth. Um, but that's good. I think it's important to be able to uh, be honest and uh, it is how we, how we grow. So uh, this was in, in Baltimore uh, around these conference times in Bad Camp and also DrupalCon. We bring the whole team together. I mentioned before we were primarily distributed. We'll talk some more about those challenges, but uh, preceding those conferences uh, a day or two, this was a two day thing, we just kind of re-envisioned where we wanted to go a lot of sticky note exercises, some thinking, different ideas, some structure to that, some engagement from individuals remote and physically present um, in setting forth, you know, some of their some of their thinking. And and so I, I designed some exercises that are that are made to, you know, maybe they're not obvious initially, but it's a bit of a pastiche. It all comes together in, in some interesting and, and meaningful way. How many people are you at this point? Uh, we are about fifteen people. Perhaps 20, it depends on uh, how you uh, calculate things. But we are uh, in our core 15. There are some uh, contractors with whom we work regularly and others irregularly. So um, I guess it's a bit of a, a probability cloud, you know, if you want to look at it that way. But there's the core, the core is, uh, is not moving so much. We host events as well. I think this is really important uh, in our our space uh, in particular. We are here at a conference um, to exchange ideas and we want to facilitate and in some uh, cases lubricate the exchange of those ideas with uh, animated dancing robots and uh, funny hats and, uh, pardon? And uh, yeah, uh, that's the, the subtext of lubrication. And uh, and so we, we, bring, we bring people together to have those conversations to, um, you know, perpetuate uh, the magic. Uh, this was at uh, at bad at bad camp, and uh, we sponsor events. We sponsored this event. We sponsor other events because it's important. You know, unless we talk, unless we get together, we uh, we're not we're not really going to make make a dent in things. You can't you can't plan it all out. We need to leave room for the informal. We need to leave uh, space for water cooler talk and more formal talks. So we'll host panels. Uh, organizing and working on a higher education summit at Bad Camp to bring the voices together from different universities. Um, and we did something kind of interesting in uh, New Orleans. We organized a funeral for Drupal 6. Uh, given that it was end of life, 
uh, and engaged a traditional uh, funeral procession and marching band, which we took to the streets. Um, had a coffin uh, for for it filled filled with uh, cupcakes, but um, uh, it was quite uh, it was quite moving. You know, in our community, we work tirelessly sometimes for many years on a project, and Drupal Six is no exception. Uh, Drupal Nine may may be the exception. But uh, some people had worked for you know six years uh, in in Drupal six uh, or more, and uh, it was kind of cathartic uh, to let it to let it go, and uh, so we did that ceremoniously and with great fun. Um, that's a little bit kind of about us. I don't know. Gives you perhaps a little bit of a sense that we are uh, playful, uh, earnest. We care about each other and uh, about about the community. Um, do you guys have any thoughts or questions before I jump into some more pie charts and things? I'm, I'm planning to show you a little bit, a little bit of that under the hood. Are you planning on staying about the same size? Planning on growing? Um, that's a, that's an interesting question. We are hiring, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, we so we are we are looking to grow a little bit. Um, one of the reasons we're looking to grow is uh, because um, the team, we're interested in building a high performance team. Everyone wants to do their best work. And in order to do that and be solvent, um, we have to fix some concurrency issues uh, that we have. Working with large institutions, feedback cycles can be long. And so we must be working on you know a lot of things at once and that can spread the team across too many things. So we're, we're looking a little bit to have um, more redundancy and, and increase a little bit of the volume of work that we're taking on so that we can achieve those, those goals um, in our practice. And that's, that's our, our primary reason to grow uh, right now. Um, there is no long-term plan after that um, we will see then what the next move, what next move makes sense. There are some other areas where we may want to, you know, dive deeper into. Um, but it really depends. At a com in a company of our size, it really depends on on the people. You know, it's not as much about the positions. And when we're talking about growth, it'd be like, hey, yeah, we should start doing more SEO, right? Like, unless you really have someone who's going to make that happen in the right context. Um, you can find that person and find a role, but we're we're just so at a certain size where it, it we we really want to play to everyone's strengths and grow organically. Yeah. I can just offer. I co-founded one of Canada's first uh, Drupal shops, and we went from like two people to thirty-five people. And in fact, if there's a lesson I took out of it is we probably should have planned for the growth instead mm -hmm. of just letting it happen organically. Yeah. At some point, we're too big to have discussions the way you used to have them. Certainly, yeah. I don't want to make it seem like there is no growth strategy at all. Um, there, are, I'm very aware of the caps that happen in an organization. Um, there are certain humps in growth, and I've learned this, uh, or this has been reinforced in talking with other agency owners, uh, uh, multiple agency owners. I, I've been privileged to be part of uh, some. Uh, networks and conferences and, and other other spaces where we talk very frankly and openly about these things. When you get past 20 people, there's there's a bit of a, a shift. You need to you incur more administrative overhead, and that's not only from a cost perspective, but also from a, a human perspective. Uh, HR becomes a lot less uh, of a thing you can do on the fly. Um, there's there's just a kind of and that then that cost increase pushes a need for for revenue to offset it. And so it can very quickly start to become a race to catch up to that financial picture. And within, you know, there's a pressure to go from like 20 to 30 to 50. Um, and and some, some people are, are on, on that track. And then once you get past like 30, then there's a sort of aesthetic where, and increasingly in our space, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but, um, you may have noticed a lot of agencies have been sold in the last few years. It's not new. Um, we'll, we'll come back around to that. But once you get past 30, then there's there's other pressures that start to happen, and and other um, you get on the radar 
of other uh, agencies that can see you as more of a threat and that, that competition becomes fiercer. So we're currently uh, still a bit uh, scrappy, uh, that lets us move nimbly and uh, we're a bit more like a, a frigate, you know, at this point, if you want to use a naval metaphor. This is how we're structured, this is a new construct that I put together this year to try and express, despite our small size, um, areas of concern and responsibility because when you are, um, you know, 15, 20 people, it's, it's a lot of different hats are being worn, but there, there has to at some point be stewardship in some key areas of the organization's organization. These are the ones that we've identified as most important to us, and each of these spaces needs decided uh, leadership. It may not be the purview of only one person to, to act in that capacity. Uh, in marketing, we formed a committee in order to move that forward. We didn't have a single person who was going to be able to achieve that mandate. Um, and uh, you know, technology is also a joint effort. We have many leaders in the technology space because we are, we are heavily um, invested in a lot of research and development and community contributions. And so that follows a little bit more of a consensus model. In support, we have a director of support that has um, more of a, that's more of a straight arrow. Um, but all of these things combine, and they're supported by a base, which is operations, which includes you know HR, legal, financial, all these kinds of runnings of things, and time management. We're all moving upwards. Uh, this this is what we uh, how we think about marketing. Um, marketing is it's communications. It's marketing and communications. And so for anything that we take on, uh, we want to evaluate its mm, relevance. You know, we can, do, we can do a lot of things, and any action that we take might impact uh, uh, m many parts of this. When we were thinking about, you know, sponsoring this event, thinking, okay, well, what, what is it? We give, we give uh, you know, $1,000 a, a to, to, to the event. Like, what do we get in return? Well, in some ways, we don't really care that much. It's, it's intangible. Um, but we also think, well, you know, maybe there's a possibility for us to increase our reach and reputation. That's important to us. Uh, we want to attract talent. That's also important to us. So we're working kind of in these spaces. I don't know how much of this, this spirit, the internal spirit, like, I mean, it's Josh and I. I think we're, we're bonding, right, Josh? We're, we're, we drank some good beers while we're here. Um, so there's a little bit of that that's going on. Um, our network loyalty and retention, not so strong. We don't have any Canadian clients. Um, we can't uh, compete in this marketplace because we have American employees that we need to pay in US dollars and the exchange rate is not favorable for an organization uh, like ours currently to, to do business in, in Canada. Um, that may change, you know, we may find other, other ways to, to make that work, but th that's just the economy uh, right now. And um, client ac so client acquisition is, even though it's really very important to us, not, not something that we are expecting to, to do here. So we're here for the spirit, uh, we're here for, for the spirit in the community, um, and uh, also to, you know, practice some of these talks, which we'll hopefully be giving in other, other times and spaces. Uh, time. Time is money, money's time, ah, whatever. It's just, it's time, you know, we're spending time on stuff. And, and, and we'll get more into like how we do that, but I, I want to share with you a little bit about um, where our money comes from when we do, when we do make money. Um, this is uh, a slide from a report that I haven't given yet to uh, <laughs> the team. Uh, there's a few more slides I need, to, I need to do and we're traveling and things, but every quarter, uh, I, I talk about our financial picture, I share our numbers, everyone is aware of what our uh, profit margins are, of where our expenses are going, uh, where, how, how well we're doing. Uh, it's really important in an organization of our size for everyone to have agency, right? To be able to be uh, an independent agent that acts responsibly in relationship to a context. It's not just a job. You know, we want to do well. We want to enjoy the work we do. We want to feel like it has meaning. And unless we understand that context, in my view, you know, there's 
it's difficult to get passionate about about that, and it's difficult to do our best work. It's, dif it's difficult to to go beyond and not feel like it's for a good reason. You know, it's it's taking something away potentially, rather than like adding. Um, we're very conscious as well of making sure that people aren't working too much, and we monitor all these kinds of things. But as I said earlier, we do a lot of work in the higher education sector. It has been 40% more or less this year. It's displaced some in um, dollars. It's probably similar, but because we've done more work in government, that slice of the pie is displacing higher ed a little bit. And um, you know, it was interesting for us to look in previous years at this uh, startup category. We had some mixed results working with startups. They expect a lot. They think they know everything and they can do it all themselves. And they, they, they need you because they don't have time and maybe it's, it's for convenience. And that's not really the kind of relationship we want to engage with. We want a respectful, like mutual conversation. We want to be partners with our clients. And so we sought to divest ourselves from working with startups. That's you know, reflected moving forward. But unless we can expose this data and share it with the team and have a conversation around it, um, you can just, you know, it's really, you're just left scratching your head, oh, what should we do, and this and that, and then we have a conversation, we talk frankly about it, it becomes really clear, and then as leadership, when, a, when a startups approach us, um, you know, I say good luck. Um, I've blanked out some of the numbers and the names of our clients here, uh, because um, there's some clients that we can't say we're working with yet. It's in contracts. As you grow as an agency, like clients get bigger, you have to sign all these things, and they say, hey, you can't tell people you're working with us. Uh, and then later, you put it in writing, you ask them, hey, can we say it now? And then they say yes, and then you can put their logo on, and then maybe they'll come back to you later and say, like, oh, you gotta take your logo off, we changed our whatever standards or whatever this. Anyhow, uh, you can, what I'm trying to, to say with this slide is that we have a long tail of income. A few clients um, that, that give us more money, a lot of clients give us a little bit of money, we operate a support program, so that's where a lot of that long tail is. But some of it in the year might just be like a big project that just ended in January, right? Um, either way, uh, what's really important here is to find a good mix. This was skewed differently in previous years. We had uh, and the team, the team wanted to work on less projects at a time, and so we needed to endeavor to change the shape of this graph because we needed a f we needed fewer larger clients so that we would be doing less at a time, and so that we worked on that, um, and things have things have shifted. Uh, things shifted, so you know, a, a mix of big clients that might be about like two big projects at the same time, um, and some other little things. And that's, that's kind of like the character, the character of like what, what work and revenue looks like. Um, on to time, this is this year so far, but uh, this is about how many hours we put in every month as a team and track. We use Harvest uh, to track our time and to build. Uh, we also use this forecast tool that they have. I don't, I don't really like it that much, but it's what we have right now. Anyhow, um, when all is said and done, we're, we're tracking and, and we're tracking over a thousand hours as a team uh, per month, and you can see that there's some of it is for administrative time, some of it's for billable hours, some of it's for R and D, and uh, for the most part. You know, we are getting close to our goals. Our goals are, are a function of revenue. That revenue is um, to meet demands of, uh, to meet the sal salary needs and, and growth needs. And so we kind of retrofit those projections, monitor them. We look at utilization. Um, when I say we, it's mostly like me and accountants. And then presenting that information to others and getting feedback and then reworking stuff, improving the way that we track the formulas that we use. So um, we're, you know, we're trying to keep people billable to a certain, at a certain rate. Different people maybe in different 
uh, percentages. But overall, uh, you know, as a company as a whole, we, we look at that holistically. Okay, what, what were kind of our, our targets? Are we, are we on, are we off of it? We compare that a little bit to revenue. We get a, a sense of where things should be. We know when there's slow months, we know when there's heavy months. We can start to get, develop more of an accurate sense and in the, the patterns of work. We know, for example, that during DrupalCon, um, you know, our, our billables take a bit of a nosedive because the entire team is there conferencing. That can't as well, and so we need to plan, plan for that. Uh, when we aren't billing, we're doing work um, internally. We track that as well, we track everything. There's some overhead to it, it's annoying. I don't like to do it. I don't think anyone really likes to do it. But there's just some things we have to do or else you know, we wouldn't be prosperous and uh, we wouldn't have clarity. Um, there's a lot of administrative time, there's a lot of development time. Um, this is actually uh, all time, not just internal time. So as an organization, we're doing a lot, a lot of development. That's the state blue slice. There's uh, R&D that we're doing and project management. And uh, those slivers are, you know, so when we look at these charts, we're like, oh, are we really tracking things appropriately? I thought we should be doing more of this or less of that so we can go back and take a look, make sure we have time forecasted to accomplish our goals in those spaces. Uh, and then when we're not billing, we'll be working on, uh, you know, different things. People might be doing some training. We have some internal projects we're working on. And uh, that's, uh, yeah, so we've re we restructured things a little bit. You'll see uh, 2016, we've moved R&D to more internal stuff. Anyways, this is just more to give you an idea. I think it'll take too long to dive too deeply into that. Uh, but ultimately, you know, what, I, what I'm, I'm talking about here is, is transparency, and um, transparency is something that not only internally uh, I think is important, but externally to our clients is really important. We don't round hours, we're very, you know, we don't want to inundate people with too much information, but we provide them, if they want it, complete transparency as to all of our time and to, in, in what we're doing for them because we are responsible, we want to demonstrate that value uh, that we're providing, and we want to be held accountable, uh, as we should be, for um, the dollars that we're charging them and the, the work that we're doing. And uh, that, that's, I think, the right thing to do. Uh, this was a, a bit of a, a workshop trust exercise that we, uh, we did in the office um, in a previous uh, iteration of these workshops. Um, but this is a spreadsheet that I use. It has some fictional numbers in it. Um, but I thought I'd share with it with you because um, I've shared it with a number of other CEOs and, and financial people. And uh, so far, uh, it's fairly unique, um, as far as I can tell, in terms of how to look at compensation. There are difficult conversations to have, particularly when you're hiring someone. There are difficult conversations to maintain after someone has been employed. Everyone is valuable, and uh, it's hard to put a number on things. Everyone has aspirational goals. Um, one of the interview questions that we ask is, um, you know, what would what would you do if you won a million dollars in the lottery? And uh, well, the follow-up question to that is, uh, what would you do if you won a hundred million dollars in the lottery? It starts to abstract that question of money and speak more to values, and that's what's what's really important, but we can't lose sight of the real financial realities. People have different goals, they have families, they have uh, different needs, um, and, and they're various. Some people want to work 40 hours a week, some people want to work less, and we want to be accommodating for that. And how do we balance that out? I mentioned before, we have people in Canada, we have people in the US, we have payroll. We're not a big company yet, we don't run payroll across the border, so we, and there, Healthcare it exists in Canada. Uh, it's called health insurance in the United States, and uh, and the, that comes at a cost, but it's a benefit uh, that we we pay for and and, and deliver to our, our American employees. But how do we how do we look at that scale across uh, across uh, across that and, and do that fairly? How do I compare compensation um, for different roles and different positions? It's not. 
I don't think it should be an arbitrary thing. I don't think it should be like a, how little can I pay you versus how much do you want? We need to have um, a contextual conversation around that. Um, I can flip over the spreadsheet maybe if this is too small, but I, I just want to walk you through a few uh, key points here. Um, so first, often people come to us and they're like, well, I'm making this much money right now, you know, but I hate my job. Uh, I want to work with clients that I care about. It's like, fantastic. You're the type of person that we want to work with. But we're also the type of company that's going to provide that kind of opportunity. If we didn't, if we didn't care, uh, we would be pushing people to be super, super billable. We would be working with clients and gouging them. And yeah, we could pay you more. Um, and you would be working all the time. And you'd probably be working on the weekends because we're going to make some unrealistic promises that we need to keep because we need to pay we need to make, make, the, make the cash. But we don't want to operate in that way, and that comes at a little bit of a trade-off, you know? People who may be 75% billable in their old job might be moving to you know, a less billable state because they're going to be doing more R&D, more community involvement, more of those things that they care about. And that comes as well at a cost for us as an organization. So we want to demonstrate that. Um, and again, to this transparency, you know, when you're, when you're working, you're making money for the organization that you're working with. Every hour that you work, you know what they're charging clients. And that's a real thing. You're like, oh, man, you know, we charge a, we're charging these clients $175 an hour. When I do the, I could be making, like, I could go out, I could do this, I could, I could charge, like, $100 an hour, and I'm, I'm working here, and I'm making, like, what, $50 an hour? Like, the, it can start to breed some kind of resentment. I think it's really important to have that conversation up front and contextualize it. Um, because there, there is a context for that, you know? There isn't a mountain of gold somewhere that we're accumulating. All this money goes to different places. 80%, 85% of our money goes to our people directly. So, um, that's what this expresses. We have a whole bunch of benefits. Benefits add up to total compensation, then we pay taxes on that. We're talking to contractors. Those contractors think, well, if I'm a contractor, I just, I'm, I'm charging $125 an hour, but then they're they're going to get dinged on their, their taxes as an independent contractor later. They don't necessarily do the math on that. They don't appreciate that their base salary is also like, uh, in addition, there's money that we pay in income tax on top of that. And so we want to be transparent around that. We add that up. It's like, here's the staffing cost for us, you know, for your salary. And uh, that's how much it equates to per hour if you do the math. Just, this is not a good column to have. It's not. Like it wouldn't be, it's not really that advantageous for when I have this conversation to show that number because, but it's honest, it's the truth. And if I don't show it, people are gonna do that math anyways. Um, and then afterwards there's the, the income. If someone is, is making, let's see like in scenario A, they're making 80K, after the total compensation and they got all the benefits, it comes out to like 93K, uh, plus afterwards our taxes, that's like 100K. So it's like they started it. 80k, but it's really costing us $100,000. So there's some context to begin with. And then uh, in scenario A, you know, they've got some time off, and then they're they're working 40 hours. There's 239 work days in a year. Um, that's 1,984 hours. They're 67 percent billable. That's 1,276 billable hours they're working. If the average billable rate that they're working is $150 an hour, hypothetically, they're generating 100 and uh, $91,000 in income for the company. Their staffing costs is $100,000. There's $90,000 that they've contributed towards the, the company's uh, financial success. And this works to balance out other roles that are non-billable that we recognize as being important in marketing and administration and HR and other things. Some people are more billable than others. We play with these numbers and look at all of this together. Um, so that we know, you know what that works out to, hourly, weekly, what margins are. Uh, we can express that, and we can express the value of a work day, of, of taking time off, of what does that mean as a, uh, a revenue, revenue that the company wouldn't be making if someone were working, otherwise known as opportunity cost. And we can play with those numbers. Some people have young, have young families, and they, or they, they have another passion that they want to pursue, and they want to work less time. So how do we do that math? We can calculate uh, how many PTO days people want to get paid time off. And as a function of that, you know, salary is adjustable. 
So there's some play that you can have with that. And we've had people um, that have shifted. They've gone, they've moved that around. They'd be like, I, I, I think, you know, uh, we had a, a, an employee, a, a team member who was at 40 hours a week and they, they wanted to go um, to London in order to pursue uh, a course, a passion that they had, and dropped down to 32 hours. And so we were able to quickly just change that up. It was an easy conversation, change the numbers, everything's proportionate, and we're, we can examine those scenarios as well. And this is important because we want people to do their best work, and their best work is going to be done if they're happy and if we're accommodating and if we're not pushing people beyond where they need to go and we're also like giving them the space to do uh, what they need to do and we can express uh, that, that growth and those growth factors. So, you know, in this case, there's some scenarios you can work through. You want to drop 40 hours to 32 hours a week. There's some math. Okay, well, you know, I think my math is off there. Uh, but anyways, this should be lower. And then you want more PTO days, and this is going to go down a little bit. And this is kind of how we have these conversations early and, and later. Yep. How? How do you treat lunch? Pardon? In your 40 hour week, how do you treat lunch? So uh, that's a good question. Um, we look at 40 hours as 40 hours that are tracked. So it, it's not um, you know, shift work. People work in different rhythms, and it's not quite the same as like, oh, you know, 15 minute breaks and half hour for lunch. Uh, it's a slightly different economy. This is uh, the norm in our industry is like 40 trackable hours. As far as I can tell from talking to most others, most other agencies, um, I have contemplated moving it down to 37 and a half hours to make some of those accommodations. Uh, our numbers don't currently support that. Right now, um, we would have to shift drastically uh, across across the board to, to make that a, a reality. Um, but it's something that we can figure out. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so that's, right. that's how so you do that. You kind of work nine to five. People work across multiple time zones, yeah. and for the most part, we have a sort of overlap spend diagram of time where we're doing stand ups. And uh, we have someone who's in Europe, so they, they stay up late because we, we value collaboration. We want to pair programming. We want to work together. This is the value. It's our strength. Um, yeah. But we want to be flexible. So the work's the work's got to get done. Uh, so what I've learned is that, and this is not new to me. When I was at school, when I was at OCAD. Um, I was uh, I ran the student union for a couple of years. I've started I started a school newspaper, which I, I ran for a few years. And um, running an agency is like uh, uh, is like creating a little government. You know, we have to take care of people. And increasingly in the U.S., it's that way uh, more and more. It's it's not it's not Canada. I learned some very interesting lessons. Uh, if someone gets injured on the job, or not on the job, and uh, you, know, you bust your hand, you can't type, in the US you're pretty much SOL. The government does not do anything for you. That is the responsibility of the company. The company is responsible for buying insurance to uh, cover that, or not. They don't have to do anything. Really, you can't work. No, you don't work. Long-term disability is a different situation. But um, here, you can't really claim uh, unemployment insurance. Uh, you can't claim unemployment insurance for a short term. I mean, you, can't, you can't do that in Canada. Healthcare costs are super, super high. You're looking at somewhere around like you know, $300 to $2,000 a month in healthcare costs, health insurance costs, um, depending on your plan and how many people and are, members, are members of your family and at what level of coverage you, know, you need to have. That's, that's pretty significant, and as a, as an, a company owner, as a Canadian, you know, I feel like there's a lot of pressure on us as a company to do things that I think should be the role of government. Um, but it's not the reality, you know, in the U.S. And that's a, it's a, it's a tricky, tricky thing, um, especially in an organization where we have people across, you know, the border on both sides. Um, I learned some interesting things about the state of New York. So I was talking earlier about like employment insurance, right? 
so we we have an employee who's in Brooklyn, team member who's in Brooklyn, and uh, there the federal uh, unemployment uh, tax is something that we've been you know deducting from their paycheck and remitting, uh, and we have insurance as well to cover um, to cover that that. Uh, portion, par portion because if someone claims the unemployment insurance, the company pays for some of it and the government pays for some of it. So that 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 is shared. Uh, but New York requires you, even if you have that insurance, you have to have a specific plan in the state of New York. In addition to that, so they decided they wanted to fine us twelve thousand dollars. So we've been fighting them, taking them to court. It's not fun. Things you learn, things we have to take care of. All this stuff, all this insurance, oh my god, employee health, short-term disability, errors and emissions, cybersecurity, commercial general liability, an umbrella liability clause because some uh, companies want you to extend your coverage for whatever arbitrary number they have, right? You need more coverage for whatever else and they want you to be insured for vehicles because, you know, you're they have some kind of overriding policy, like you're not even physically there in the space. You're not a delivery truck or anything. There's, there's like all kinds of crazy complications that we, you know, end up isolating our, our team members from, but they're things that, that I've, I've learned are important, things I need to do. And I, if I, I don't know if I, if I had, like if someone had made a list of all these things that I was gonna have to do, if I would have started this necessarily. So. Please don't let me uh, scare you off if you're thinking about you know, starting your own uh, company. There's, there's lessons that you'll learn along the way, uh, but, but it's good to be aware that, that there, there are things that, that you'll, you'll need to figure out. Taxes, okay, here's another difference with the US and Canada. This is, this is, this is crazy, so, um, and I learned this too about, uh, about the, the US, so, okay. There's the Republicans and there's the Democrats, right? And there's the conservatives and there's the liberals. It's not the same thing at all, at all. They're not just more extreme, but the Republicans think about the country in terms of a republic, like an actual republic where they really just don't give a crap about the federal government and they want to do their own thing. That's why you have all these militias. That's why you have like all of these enclosed states. And each of those states legislate their own way how they're going to deal with taxation on for employee payroll. Which means every employee that we add to payroll, we need to sign up with that state. We need to levy specific kinds of taxes. Even certain cities have other taxes. So in order to run a distributed company and find the best talent and work in this way, we need to do all this huge paperwork for every single state, for every single person, for every single unique situation. And, and it's confusing. You saw it in New York, they have some like weird thing. Every state's got like some weird thing. And there's all these, all these things we need to levy and do. Fortunately, you know, there's payroll companies that do this kind of stuff and software and all that. And you don't have to think about it for the most part. Um, but it's a thing, you know? It's, it's a thing to wrap your head around. It's a, lot, it's a lot of other stuff. We just want to make some websites. You know, we're just trying to make some websites, do some pull requests. Um, but yeah, tax situation's different all over the place. So, time check, almost done. Um, we are distributed, as I mentioned. We use tools, you know, these are familiar to you. I'm sure you guys have heard of Slack, Jira Confluence, there's been some talks about it. Trello, GitHub, all these G Suite things. Uh, it's a new era of collaboration. Collaboration tools are maturing. Uh, more and more uh, interesting, you know, collisions here. There's not a lot of great open source alternatives. There are open source alternatives to all of this, and we use them in Occupy and um, built our own as well to be like fervent about it. Um, but as an organization, like we, we can't afford downtime. Can't, we, can't, we can't be like, oh no, our like, custom project management tool has crashed and now we have to stop everything we're doing and take two days to fix it. Like, that is a lot, that's a huge cost to our, our project schedules and everything. So we incur a lot more costs. We pay like over $35,000 like, just to, for all these different licenses. It's only $5 a month per person. That's it. Uh, 
uh, something else that we do uh, every Friday, uh, we have an all hands meeting. Everyone dials in. We make a slide up and talk about our week, how things were going for us personally. This is my slide this week. I was here with my parents, uh, digging through the old photo albums. This is my son. It was a baby picture of me. I was like floored. It's like, it's a little me. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, and then I also discovered something else that was really new uh, that I didn't know why this image we had on our website resonated so much with me. But I was digging through the family albums and found these pictures of myself playing in the playground when I was young. This picture in a slide over there. It's like, oh, amazing. So I shared that with the team. And everyone's got a slide like this. Amazing, incredible events in, every, in everyday lives. Um, someone's best friend uh, was murdered this week in Texas, shot in his apartment. Um, other people are going through uh, tremendous journeys of, of recovery. Um, you know, it's all life and death, and it, it's important to stay connected. And it's, it's actually kind of incredible when you're, when you are, when you don't, when you aren't just kind of seeing each other all the time. Sometimes the engagements can be stronger um, when they're micro-engagements. So we try to keep in touch. Um, we try and stay. We try and stay. Uh, how do? We, but but to this this other question of of um, you know the future and staying relevant as an agency. Uh, I'll give you some thoughts on that. Um, I know we're running a little bit close to the wire here. I got five more minutes on the timer. Two more minutes on the timer. Um, so we've, we've done a lot of interagency collaboration this year working with others on larger projects. That's another way that we can remain relevant. Uh, we had a little bit of a problem with project management and some hires that didn't work out, so lined up some collaborations um, to augment you know, some of our capabilities with other uh, capabilities of others um, and, and round out our, our offerings. Uh, other things that we're dealing with, you know, Drupal 8 is decidedly an enterprise solution. Um, it's hard to build small websites in Drupal 8. Uh, it's hard to build small websites in, in Drupal, you know, generally, but there's ways to do it. There's lots of great distributions. There's ways that you can streamline your business and say, like, I want to make restaurants, restaurant websites and find some economies there, but um, in large, complex ecosystems, we're finding that's the case. But that means that we're, um, you know, we're moving up market to make those projects worthwhile. We need those 100, 200, 300k plus projects to make those margins work. Um, and a lot of other people do too, and the, the mid-market is getting crowded. Um, and that, that 100k plus, that's mid-market now. Um, I built, you know, was building my first websites as a freelancer. Uh, <laughs> I'll do a website for $5,000. That's no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do less. Um, but what does that mean, you know? How are these other agencies that we're going against be, keep, keep be remaining competitive? Well, they're doing a lot of different things. They're buying smaller agencies to acquire talent in order to be able to deliver those services. They're driving uh, prices. Uh, they're driving their costs down by offshoring development. They are... Um, also, uh, sometimes trying to price you out um, and doing, doing work to get their foot in the door and underbidding. Um, there's a lot more competition. Our, our biggest competition right now, uh, in, in the jobs that we've lost um, that hurt the most, are uh, the ones that we've lost to design firms that don't have strong technical capabilities. And they've won important mission-critical technology programs in Drupal because they had flashy presentations. And, um, and we know that, and this has happened time and time again, we have these clients come back to us afterwards in support, and we uh, fix the problems, and we, we make it work, and we save the day. But, um, you know, it's, it's tough. It's tough out there, and it's getting harder. It's getting a lot harder. So we have to think about you know, what we can do um, on that lower end of the spectrum. It shouldn't be that unreasonable to build a website for $50,000. Know, we're having more and more trouble doing that. So is Drupal the answer? 
maybe not. We're diversifying. We're doing more static sites. We're doing some other stuff. Um, and that's important. We have these mission-driven orgs we work with. They need to succeed. And as these, cha as these changes occur, as technology changes, which it will continue to, always, 10 years ago, it's a different landscape, 10 years from now, it's completely different. Um, our value proposition ultimately isn't fruitful. It isn't technology, even though that is a strength and a differentiator. Our real value is, is people. You know? It's our people and our process and what we're able to do together and how we're able to grow together. And, uh, and that's what we really need to invest in. And if you're thinking about um, the agency that you work with for, you know, look around at, at the people. They're, they're why you come to work every day. And uh, it's important that those, those relationships are maintained. Uh, and that's changing. The nature of work is changing. There's a lot more remote, remote work going on. And, uh, we, uh, we are adapting. I, I'd love to dive deeper into that question. Uh, my friend, who's a, an economist, was probing me on these matters, and we've, we've begun a really interesting exchange on, on, that, um, on that topic about whether or not, you know, some economists think like, oh, you know, everything's becoming so with technology, you know, people will work less, right? You know, you guys work in technology, you work less every day, every week, right? You, you start your day on Monday, and you're just like, all right, I have, I have a difficult problem. I solved it on Monday. I'm gonna take the rest of the week off. That's it. I'm done, because that, that was easy. Look what I did. I did something, and it took me a day. Uh, to, five years ago, it would have taken me uh, you know, a week or a month to accomplish this, but I installed the library, and it works. Great, you know, you don't walk away. There's a drive, there's a, there's, clients are expecting more and more. They want it to be intuitive and clean. They want it to, to behave like billion dollar websites like Google, you know? We're facing these upward pressures and, and we're fighting. We're fighting to meet those expectations and exceed them. Um, and yeah, anyways, we could dive, we could dive deeper into that. Uh, but we're out of time. Uh, I wanna thank you for listening to me for so long on this last session. to be here. See you next year. Uh, yes, questions. A very good one. So now that we Google has become so people they cannot use to use the like for one size anymore. So which part of the is you are at the one size time and higher than Pardon me, which market which market particles are developing for the one that you find? Adopting uh, more and more. Yeah. Uh, well uh, I don't know about more and more. I mean, some market verticals have become nearly saturated. There's still some increases. Uh, higher education has been a strong proponent of Drupal for many, many years. About 40% of higher education is, is there, I'd say, at this point. It's hard to get exact statistics because many universities don't even know how many websites they have. There's just so many out there. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the nonprofit spaces are, in my view, shrinking. In, in Drupal market adoption, a lot of them are moving to WordPress. Uh, and then there's uh, Enterprise. You know, Enterprise is just adopting Drupal like, like gangbusters. Acquia is doing a lot of, a lot of pushing there. And, um, and so they've, they've really made some, some inroads into those spaces. Uh, and then there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of unknown. There's, we, don't, we don't hear about a lot of things. Um, so I don't know if that's my two cents. Uh, and government. Uh, I'm happy to stick around and chat if anyone wants, but I, I don't want to keep keep others have things to do, places to be.